Well, hello everyone, welcome again to Painless Universal Conversation with myself and Marsh. Today I'm truly excited to be joined by Derek Miles. Before we get started and I'll tell you a little bit about him, Derek will be talking about his journey as an entrepreneur, a black founder who's founded a company called Coric Med, helping people, patients especially, get access to the medicine faster. He'll be telling us why he's decided to go into this process this area of men, uh, area of business, how he as a black man got access to funding, what you need if you're out there thinking about starting your own company but not quite sure that your race might be a barrier to your success. What other things you could do to help you speed up that process? Well, let me tell you a little bit about my guest, Derek. So Derek Mouse founded his company, Coric Med, in 2018 as a pharmaceutical delivery service. The company has six further does diversify in its offering in providing well-care solution through partnerships with others. The company's headquarters in Texas with a new regional office announced in Miami Beach. Corin Med is system significantly expanding in various regions. As a startup, Corin Med was chosen, chosen by Microsoft for Startup Fund to receive technical business and skill support to help them scale on a larger level. So what's truly fascinating about this whole bit is that Derek Miles has worked in the healthcare sector for a very long time, but he decided to give this up to start his own business and take on that ch challenge of being an entrepreneur. Miles had it all by everyone's standards, but he wanted more, including quality time with family. He also wanted the opportunity to generate well, true entrepreneurship. And this is why he started his company, Colin Med. Meet my amazing guest, Derek Miles, as he shares his own story and his journey. Well, hello everyone and welcome again to Painless Universal, a conversation with myself and Walsh. As I said in my introduction, today we're talking about the entrepreneurship pain, the joys, the struggle, and how everyone wants to be that successful guy out there. My guest will be telling you about his own journey, why he decided to start his own company, what it means to him, and why he believes if you take the very step in life, you could achieve your own goal and help your community. Meet my amazing guest, Derek, as he shares his story. How are you? I'm encouraged today, and thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm super delighted to have you. I mean, your story, you know, you you founded this amazing pharmaceutical delivery service company in 2018. You know, it's not like something you've had a long time ago. And you just started this in 2018. Already, this company is, is being talked about, something that's going to be valued at over a billion dollars if you put it out on the market. And you've always had this intense desire, you know, more than others, to impact people and do what is right. This is fascinating. Before we get started, who are you? Well, uh, the first thing that I am, I'm an encourager, right? So I, I believe that my role on earth and then my goal on earth is to be the person that's known to encourage the most people. When I pass away and people say, you know who encouraged the most people? It was Derek Miles. So number one, I'm an encourager. Number two, I'm a leader. My mom, I have an identical twin brother. And when we were in her womb, mm -hmm. she was looking at names and she came up with Derek and Derek meant leader of people. So when I was in the womb, she wanted me to be a leader. So before I started Core Med, I worked in corporate America, became CEO at the age of 31. But by the time I turned 37, 38, it was my opportunity to, to really move forward with encouraging more people in the world, because when I was in corporate America, especially when you're in the corner office, you're around people, what I call like A players. And the A players have really found out that that simple, that thing inside them that motivates them. But it's the other people I would walk in the hallway and I could realize that they haven't found that thing yet. So my goal was to step out of cor corporate America and start utilizing my goal of encouragement, my gift of encouragement to help other people realize their own gifts. So I wrote a book years ago called Superhuman Performance, and Superhuman Performance is just about that. The gifts that you have inside of yourself, if you learn how to use them, your performance just goes to a much higher level. So again, who I am, number one, I'm an encourager. Number two, I'm a leader. And then number three, I just want other people to be encouraged and, 
and uh, live their best life by using the gifts that's inside of them. Absolutely. That's really phenomenal. When you look at your life, you know, you've talked a little bit about your mother. When you look at your life growing up, what was your childhood like? We were very poor uh, growing up. So my brother and I, identical, as I mentioned before, my mother was 17 when she had us. So she and my father had to drop out of high school and go to work so they could support us. But uh, it was a lot of love in the house. So we didn't know that we were poor until we wanted like toys. I just noticed that I didn't have my own toys. I always had to share my toys with my brother. And after a while, I, I, I knew it, I didn't like that, right? So even before you're like 15 in the United States that you can get a job, when I was like 10, we would get my father's lawnmower. We'll go throughout the neighborhood and mow people's lawns so that we can create some income for ourselves. And I would go to the store and I would buy two magazines. The uh, one magazine I would buy was called um, RC Model Cars. So we didn't have enough money to buy these really fancy, fast cars, but I would buy the magazine like every month just to motivate myself. And the other magazine I would buy is Rob Report. So Rob Report is like the number one luxury magazine in the world. Here I am 13 years old buying Rob Report at, at that age because it was speaking to me. So I'll tell you another story. So uh, I have two boys now, my wife and I, we have two boys. And when I got old enough and I started making money and my kids were old enough to actually handle a RC model car, I bought one and I didn't buy it for them. I bought it for me because I, I never could afford one when I was little. So they got to play with it, but it was really my goal all that time to have that RC model car. And what we're able to do today with the company Corbin, I can just tell you a little bit more about it, is that we do have individuals from all over the world who have been able, who've been touched by our platform. They typically are more affluent and uh, they prefer to get healthcare services in the comfort of their home, condo, luxury hotel, corporate office, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, one of the upcoming Exposés on Cormet will actually be in Rob Report. But that'll be another goal in, in my life that I've been able to accomplish uh, yeah. you know, over 40 years. This is fantastic. I, I, I can't believe you know you decided you you got a present for your kids, and that was something you'd be fascinated about. This is something you've truly always wanted. And you know, your childhood dream, you that was something that in memory that you stayed with you for a very long time, and that kept your determination going. Now, when you look at your childhood, one of the things that's also fascinated you with also health is also your cousin. You lost your cousin to sickle cell anemia. And, yeah. and this event has also helped you in this direction of going into the medical healthcare. Can you just tell us a little yeah. bit about that journey? Because I mean, sickle cell is something people are now talking about, but before it wasn't very prominent now. Can you tell us a little bit about the sickle cell and yeah. how it affected yeah. your cousin? Yeah, sickle cell impacted uh, our family in a negative way. One, because Timmy had sickle cell anemia and he passed away from sickle cell. Mm -hmm. But I also have sickle, my brother and I have sickle cell trait. Mm -hmm. So it impacted my ability to play sports because with, with sickle cell, the, the, bot, the, the cell sickle are not perfect like circles. So it decreases the amount of oxygen. So I couldn't play my favorite sports after a certain age because I was like re breathing really, really tough. So that was, that's how it impacted me. But on Timmy, not only was he our cousin, he was like a brother uh, because he actually lived with us. So when he passed away, it was like one of your brothers passing away. And one of Timmy's dreams, even when he was younger, he, he knew that the finance industry had a way to create generational wealth. I didn't know anything about it. When he went to the University of Florida, he said, I'm going into finance. So because I was, became a CEO at such an early age, I had ac accomplished my goals in healthcare. I said, you know what I'm gonna do next? I'm gonna get into this finance arena and accomplish Timmy's goals. So before we started CoreMed, um, I looked into private equity and venture capital and it became you know, pretty, I had to teach myself it, right? And because I was able to teach myself, that's how we were able to parlay into relationships with Google and Microsoft and AT&T. And I know those are all United States companies, but it was because my desire to accomplish Timmy's goals uh, is some of the foundation, how that happened. 
That's, a, that's truly amazing because you also set, set up an endowment fund and yep. you did this as a tribute to your cousin, Timmy, and I'm, I'm really glad. For anyone who's listening right now and will want to take part in this endowment fund, what, what is the benefit of this and how can this help other sickle cell warriors out there? Yeah, so it's set up at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where I went to graduate school, the number one program in health administration, I always have to say that, but it, it gives students who may come from a disadvantaged background an opportunity to, do, to get a degree in health administration, right? Um, I thought about becoming a physician until I started reading about how much the healthcare executives make, right? So it's a way to create awareness for people in a community that comes like so one they have to be from the state of florida that's where i'm originally from and then two um have an interest in healthcare. Mm -hmm. and and when students apply there's i think i put fifty thousand dollars in that particular uh fund you know they get scholarships to defray their tuition to defray their book costs to to go and travel et cetera et cetera et cetera and lastly, they get an opportunity to get mentored by me. And uh, I, I take mentorship very, very seriously. And I, I give them all the tools and the tricks to get to the corner office to hopefully become a CEO one day. And uh, after they become a CEO, now that I've learned about generational wealth, because people start speaking into my life, right? Yeah. Now that I've learned about generational wealth, I can take them to the next level on who I know now yeah. and know that you actually have own something to create generational wealth. It's not that you work in an organization and create wealth for many, many generations. You have to own a company that generates revenue that can be sold, mm -hmm. not just about being an entrepreneur. You have to create a company that someone else wants to purchase or buy. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's sold for hundreds of millions or, or billions of dollars. And we're excited that Believe it or not, we had multiple companies come after us and, and consider uh, acquiring our platform. And as you mentioned, we just launched it in 2018, which uh, okay. says to me is that we're making an impact on people's lives. It's not about the money. I think when I'll go into this encouragement piece, one thing I do know that everyone, the human spirit desires to be encouraged. We don't say it to, to each other. There's an area in your life, I don't know you, right? But I guarantee you there's an area in your life that you want to work better. That's what you're probably praying about. That's the area that there's some discouragement there. Mm -hmm. So within CoreMed, whenever we do a, a service or deliver a product, at the bottom of the package, it says, be encouraged. Because we don't know what they're going through. We just want to give them a word of encouragement. And because we're encouraging people all over the world, yesterday we were you know, working with patients in China. We touch patients in Brazil and, and Sweden and Japan, uh, Mexico, Canada. We don't know how they find out about us. I have no clue, but when they do, our, our goal is to provide an encouraging experience to each and every person that encounters our service. Well, we found you, so definitely you guys are doing marvelous work. We're about here in United Kingdom, so if you can find you, I think you guys are definitely doing something right. <laughs> yeah, so there you know, Derek, you were called you were called a wonder kid for turning around um the acute care health facilities and was a CEO of a Texas Texas health care um company at the age of 31. And I read that at the age of 31, you already see you know, running this company. So, but you then something happened. You decided to leave this corporate yeah. world. You knew that yeah. you probably have, you absorbed what you needed to learn. You decided to leave and take that risk of becoming an entrepreneur, the scary thing. Because everyone, when you're in that corporate world, just what, what, you know, what baffles me is this, you did this. And like in the corporate world, you're comfortable. Everything is taken care of. All you just need to do is deliver on your role. You don't need to think about the other bits of the role because you have the people. Oh, other people oh, have the bits for you. And there you are. You decided to do it. What was going through your mind? Well, I had already, you know, it was just like this inner feeling that it was time for me to do something else. I had already had that feeling. But then one day I was sitting in my, I was, I was, having, I was having a conversation with one of the physicians at the hospital. And he said, you know what? You remind me of this entrepreneur. I want you to talk to him. His name is Joel Wiggins. So they put us together and um, we just have pleasantries. And within the first 30 seconds of the conversation, he says, you're not going to be there much longer. There's something else for you to do. And I got quiet because I knew he was right. 
And um, I was you know, making a nice sum of income in corporate America. And I didn't want to take that jump because I was afraid, just being honest, I was afraid that I was going to lose my safety net by becoming an entrepreneur. But I knew it was something I needed to do. And him telling me on the phone just gave me that extra bit of courage mm -hmm. and the extra uh, ability to be brave and say, hey, I'm going to go for it. So I went for it. And like most entrepreneurs, I've, I experienced so many setbacks, so many trials and tribulations, so many bouts was with discouragement. I'll, I'll tell you the story where, where the, the foundation for CoreMed, because again, you mentioned I became a CEO at 31. I had multiple homes, $100,000 car in the driveway. But when I became an entrepreneur, I did not have access to people to help me get things done anymore. And things were just taking so long for me to see any type of traction that I got so discouraged that I wanted to take my life one day. And I remember like it was yesterday, um, we have two boys, the youngest boy, I was going to take him to school. I was going to come home and blow my brains out, right? So I take him to school and I come home, go down to the basement. I'm looking for the gun to blow my brains out and I can't find the gun. Gun's missing. And I, and, I, and I hid the gun so the boys can't find it. And here I am, I can't find it. I'm tearing the basement up, can't find the gun. Then my phone starts to ring. Um, it was a friend from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He says, Derek, I don't know why I'm calling you today. But I just felt you need to be encouraged. And I'm like, thank you. Hung the phone up. Phone rings again. A friend of mine from St. Louis calls, a female friend. She says, Derek, I don't know why I'm calling you today, but I just felt the need that you needed a word of encouragement. And I'm like, thank you. Hung the phone up. Phone rings again. A friend from Dallas, Texas he says, Derek, oh man, I don't know why I'm calling you, but I just felt you need to be encouraged today. Hung the phone up. And at the end of that third phone call, I was encouraged. I wasn't discouraged anymore. And that day I realized the power of a word of encouragement. Yeah. Because that those words of encouragement saved my life that day. So if a word of encouragement can save my life, imagine what a word of encouragement can do for someone else who may be considering the same thing. Yeah. So whenever I speak all over the country in the United States for right now, I always have someone come up to me and say, Derek, I saw your story. And man, I was there. I'm just so thankful that you shared that story. Mm -hmm. So within CoreMed, I, I made a decision that day, if an encouraging word can make me turn my, my whole mental thought press around, process around, I'm going to start a company and it's going to be about encouraging people. Yeah, we have this innovative platform, but at the end of the day, it's about encouraging people. So when you look at the, the word CoreMed, C-O-U-R, most people think that stands for courier. It does not. The middle of the word of encouragement has C-O-U-R. So as I mentioned before, we're in the encouraging people business. And, and I believe that's the foundation of, of why people are finding us. Um, we, we're we not a perfect company, even though we've got investments from Microsoft and Google and AT&T. And we're actually in the process of talking to a Fortune 5 company about a potential partnership. Um, we still have a lot of work to do over here. Um, as far as being able to uh, encourage people from all around the world. If, if I'm to ask you, um, sitting here, to describe your company, could you tell us a little bit about CoreMed? What is that? Yeah, real easy. We're a concierge health and wellness company. So think of anything from a healthcare perspective where you used to have to leave your home, leave your condo, leave your office, leave your luxury hotel to get healthcare services. You don't have to do that anymore. We have doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, dentists, optometrists, massage therapists who are all on our platform. And we have concierge. So you can call 833 CoreMed and say, hey, I need a COVID test. And we'll have a nurse come to your luxury hotel and give you a COVID test. Or someone say, hey, I'm 50 years and older. I noticed that my body is not responding the way it used to respond. I want to get exosome therapy. Like me, I, I, I've taken exosome therapy. And then we'll, in like two days, we'll have someone, a nurse to your house giving you exosome therapy. So from A to Z, you think of it, healthcare, it's in the comfort of your own residence. That's what that core med is. Well, that's fascinating because, I mean, I'm, you know, I have sickle cell anemia. So this is something I'm always, um, I know you didn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, I do. Have to, I am full blown sickle cell. So um, anything medical is something that uh, really fascinates me and sits with me because I'm always anxious to know if I'm in this part of the world, how would I be looked after? I'm always worried. When you think of your me uh, core med, your company, is it just in a particular state in the United States or is this everywhere in the United States? If I'm in New York, can I utilize this service? And if, if someone foreign, could they also utilize the service? And how does that information go past it, pass down to the medical doctors like your GP, you know, like in United Kingdom, we call them the your GP. I don't know if we call them family, family doctors. How does that information yeah. you gather then get passed down onto them? Yeah, so what CORMED is, is a um, extension of the GP. So we have two types of physicians that we work with in CORMED. We have concierge physicians, and then we have direct primary care physicians. So if you have those type of physicians, you all your information is shared because there's an extension, right? So when you're talking about a concierge physician or a direct primary care physician in their setup, you really just only have access to that particular doctor. Where CORMED comes in, we bolt on, now you got a concierge nurse, and you got a concierge pharmacist, and you got a concierge dentist, and you got a concierge massage therapist, right? So that information is passed back to them. Now, what makes us unique is that we do not take insurance. So you living in the United Kingdom, maybe insurance is not that big of a deal, but in the United States, it is, right? We have been uh, programmed here in the United States to believe that insurance is the best option. And me being a former healthcare executive, I'm going to say it is not. It just makes things take longer. So if you have insurance and you wanted to get like an exosome therapy or a monoclonal antibody, it would not happen the same day. It will not happen the next day because of the bureaucracy in that particular process. So within CORMED, we're able to relieve pain same day. So let me tell you about when I was in corporate America dealing with all that stress, I would get migraine headaches. And if you ever had a migraine headache, you don't want to wait three or four days for your medication to come in the mail. You want relief now. So that's how we built our platform within CORMED. We're bolt on to uh, concierge physicians and direct primary care physicians so that they can extend their services and provide, you know, an end-to-end concierge experience for their patients. Now, we already treat Patients from around the world, our head major headquarters in uh, Dallas, Texas, just a little north, um, so called McKinney. But we launched a additional, an additional headquarters in Miami Beach in October of 2021. And when we launched in Miami Beach, Miami Beach is an international city. So people from all the world, around the world, come into Miami Beach. So we've been able to, that's how we've been able to treat the lion's share of the people from around the world. And then um, the, the only sometimes barrier is language. So one of the things that we're actually embedding into our app now is like Google Translate. So you can just speak in your native Swedish and then whoever your caretaker is can communicate back through the Google Translator and you can have those conversations. So that's one of the new things that we're putting in place uh, to, to help us with um, language barriers. That's it. That's interesting. So, you know, you're still an entrepreneur. When you think about your process, how have you learned to the journey? How have you learned the stress, dealing with the stress, dealing with being everything? How have you, how yeah. have you done it? So when you're a hospital administrator in an academic setting, there, there's two constraints. One, money. Number two, people. You just don't have access to the same type of money if you're a hospital that was in a suburb. You don't have access to the A players to bring into your organization so you can perform at the highest standard. Well, when you're running a startup, guess what you don't have access to? You don't have access to money. You don't have access to A players. So when I started with Incorment, I was so accustomed to operating in that environment that I knew what to do. I knew how to build my own like spreadsheets that can help me manage the, the money side of the business. I knew how to bring in what we call fractional executives when we, we pay them for the work that they do instead of having someone on payroll the entire time and you may not be getting 100% productivity out of that person. Yeah. But it's become much easier now that Microsoft came in and invested, right? So now we're able to hire these A players and I don't have to do all the thinking. 
do I still get tired? Yes, I still get tired because we're, we're running a startup. I, I don't have 500 FTEs, full-time equivalents, like I used to have in a hospital, mm -hmm. but I do have a lot of A players, right? So I don't have to do all the thinking, but I'd still have to work on the relationship with Microsoft, the relationship with Google, the, the relationship with this pending healthcare company that's looking to do a partnership and big companies take a long time to make decisions. So it doesn't happen quickly. There's hundreds of people to manage in Microsoft. There's hundreds of people to manage in, in Google. You're, you're talking about companies with north of 150,000 employees. Yeah. So that, that is a lot to uh, strategize and, and figure out the best way to get things done. It does not happen fast. So you, you have to have, I will say, the runway, the financial runway, so you can continue to make, uh, hit your financial, I would say, goals so that your board is not beating you up that, you know, hey, I know we have this potential opportunity with this company, but we still have to make a certain amount of revenue. So the beautiful thing about we have a new investor called Alternative Wealth Partners, in addition to Microsoft, that gives us that runway so that I can take the necessary requisite time to, to work with our, our larger partners. That's wonderful. You, are, you know, one other thing, Derek, about you is that you talk about this mentorship. You're very good at, about it. I mean, you believe that this is a, um, in a pathway to get other people, uplift other people. So when you, when you think about mentoring people, what is needed for some, from someone to be a good mentor? Uh, you have to be a good listener and understand that mentorship and menteeship goes both ways. It can't be just take, take. It has to be give and take, right? So I'll tell you there, that has been the foundation of everything in my life has been a mentor. For me to get to the corner office at the age of 31, it was because the highest ranking African-American hospital administrator was my first boss. So I got to learn from him. Someone introduced me to him. So I got to watch him in action for years, how he did it. So it was a lot easier for me to get to the corner office at 31. But when I left hospital administration, I met a gentleman here in Dallas, Texas, who was a former physician. He worked in private equity. And he basically taught me how to think bigger. He, he taught me how to, you know, the right ways to fundraise and the right way to form partnerships were given to me. So now I freely give them back to individuals. I, I am partial to the University of Alabama at Birmingham, but if someone makes a recommendation for me to mentor someone and, and we make sure that that uh, partnership is mutual, do it all day. It, it, one of our struggles in life, I think, is that spirit going. I think we all want to be entrepreneurs and we want to get this business going. But some days it takes a lot to motivate yourself because you are your own boss. You are the only person who is determined. I know you have the shareholders who are you know, get, getting you to motivate you, but it takes a lot to keep that entrepreneurship spirit alive to say, I want to do that. How do you keep your spirit alive and saying that I believe in my work, I know I'm going to make a difference, and I know this is going to produce that revenue I'm destined to make, with, that everyone is asking me to make? How do you do that? You know, believe it or not, it's the people that I could keep around me. I, I, I believe in. Um, spending my time with people who encourage me. Those are the people I put around me all day. Believe it or not, you won't believe this. Today has been one of the toughest days I've ever had. But one of my board members and I, we spent an hour on the phone. We were just talking about different books and different things that we need to do to keep one another encouraged. Yeah, so I always have this saying, I didn't make this up. Some days I feel like I'm on top of the world. Other days I feel like the world's on top of me, right? But it's always me being in an environment. Another thing I want to say is your environment. So I make sure that I'm in an environment that encourages my spirit. So one of our partners with Encore Med is a, a luxury hotel called The Addition. So when I'm in Miami Beach, I'm always at The Addition because that's the environment where I, I, I feel the most encouraged. That's the environment where I'm meeting people who can actually help us grow Core Med. That's the environment where the lion's share of our customers from China and Japan and Switzerland, I've met at the addition, right? So number one is the people that I keep around me. And number two is the environment that I am that, that keeps me going. So when you, uh, I, I'm so fascinated about this healthcare concierge model of a business. 
because it's something I really hope that one day you guys will integrate this system in the United Kingdom for business, for delivering well care solution to consumer. And you chose this business model. When you were thinking about it, what truly inspired you? What were some of the gaps you saw in the market that you realized that this is something that needs to be, this is an area that we're to totally failing at? I know you've touched on it, but I've not really asked that yeah. question. What were what was some yeah. of the gaps that inspired you to really touch on this market side? Believe it or not, Amazon. Oh. So when I was um, at home one day, my Wi-Fi system went down. So I go online, like, I want to buy a Wi-Fi system for my entire house. And I saw this button, get it today. I'm like, no way. So I pressed that button to get it today. And someone showed up that day and they brought my Wi-Fi system. And I set it up. I'm like, wow, this was a lot. This was at least six, seven, eight years ago, right? When that, that happened. I'm like, man, they can do that with delivering an apparatus to my house. What if we can do the same thing with healthcare? So that's when we really got to the idea of core med of how we can bring like vitamins and prescriptions and supplements to people's house that same day to, to alleviate pain. When the pandemic hit, people started researching, you know, different solutions. And that's when Microsoft found us and Google found us and Amazon found us. They didn't invest, but Amazon actually taught us how to deliver healthcare services the same way that we deliver healthcare products. So in the United States, when uh, COVID, you got COVID, there's this product called a monoclonal antibody. I don't know if it was as um, popular in the UK, but you can get a monoclonal antibody and then the next day you feel better, right? So I got a call from one of my colleagues at Amazon Pharmacy. She says, Derek, we're, we're a large company. We're not as nimble as you are. The next thing that's coming is monoclonal antibodies. Do you think you can do it? I'm like, we've never done it before, but we'll give it a shot. So through that partnership, we did, we delivered a monoclonal antibody and we saw the revenue difference, right? So we're delivering prescriptions and vitamins and supplements. We may make five or six bucks, right? Yeah. But on the monoclonal antibody, we we're making hundreds of dollars on each one of them. And our revenue just spiked up. And I called a board meeting and I said, we need to flip this model. We need to start delivering healthcare services to people same day to make them better and, and encouraging them. So I'm going to tell you a story and it makes me, anything around money is okay, but the stories around people's lives being better is the ones that really get to me. So one of our board members got COVID and his wife calls me. She says, Derek, I'm say blank has COVID. And he needs a monoclonal antibody. This is not him. He is out of it. So I'm like, okay, let's get his information. We got his prescription order for the monoclonal antibody. Nurse shows up that same day, gives him the infusion. He calls me the next morning. He says, Derek Miles. He says, I woke up this morning. The sun was shining. I'm outside working out again. He says, thank you, brother. So those are the stories that, that really motivate me or when people are in a situation and they use CORMED and, and now they're encouraged and now they go out and, and tell other people. So maybe that's what it is. People have been encouraged by our platform and, then, and it's just like word of mouth that's, that's getting out there. But That's good. Yeah. You know, our conversation is really about a lot of pain that people have to go through to get to wherever they need to get to because it could be the entrepreneurship pain, it could be the pain of the patient. This time we'll be focusing on pain of the patient. Well, what kind of pain can you describe when a patient um, is out, are often discharged from hospital and realizes they need this um, medicine? Where, where are you guys feeling this gap and giving them this joy of easy assets to whatever they need? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to answer that two ways, right? Because we, we do we cover the entire United States through partnerships. So when you look at a company like Microsoft, they use partnerships to continue to grow and scale. And that's the same thing we do. And as I mentioned before, we partner with concierge physicians, direct primary care physicians, pharmacies, you name it. So through those partnerships, nurses, nurse practitioners, we are up and running in every, I would say, gateway city in the United States. We haven't figured out yet how Canada works. We haven't figured out how the UK works, right? So once we figure that out, we'll be in those additional countries. 
Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it, it's really simple. People call us from all over the world. Uh, we got a call from New Zealand last week about they were shooting for Netflix and could we get some of their actors and their assistants COVID-19 shots? And we were able to do it, right? But because through those those partnerships, but I do want to say they they do pay a premium because it, you know they're, they're in a situation. Help, let me tell you this story, okay? There was an executive, high end executive from Detroit, Michigan. Don't know how. He calls us. He finds us. He's in Mexico. He says, "I have COVID. My doctor tells me I need a monoclonal antibody. Can you get it to me?" I'm like, sure we can. Uh, we had to fly a nurse to Mexico and fly the drug over there. We can get it to you the next day. He says, how much are you going to charge me? I gave him the price. He says, done. So the next day, um, our nurse is on the first flight out to Mexico. She gives him his monoclonal antibody. And he calls me. He says, Derek, I just want to thank you. I can get back home to my family now. So those are the stories of encouragement where we, we'll go above and beyond to, to help people there experiencing pain and we help alleviate that pain through our, through our platform. Oh, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I still have a few questions in terms of the black funding because you know you're a black owned founder and CEO of your company and you know we see what's happening around the world where black found, uh, black founders found it, find it difficult and even if yeah. they do get funding they tend to get the very municipal funding which barely takes them from A to B but you've been yeah. so lucky, you've received funding, generous funding from Microsoft, who you now classify as a partner. They founded for, um, they've done the Microsoft founding for Startup and Google uh, Black Funder Fund. What yeah. impact has this funding made to your business and what encouragement would you give to other Black people who might be struggling, who have great ideas like yourself, but you know, no way of getting that funding to fund the business? Yeah, well, number one, thing is done for is giving us credibility, right? So people go out and they and they do their research when they see Microsoft and Google and AT&T on our website, it gives us a lot of credibility. And through that credibility, it makes it so much easier when you reach out and, and you want to form a partnership. So that's number one. Number two, I do have to let you know that before we got that Microsoft and that Google funding, it was like, uh, pulling teeth for people to meet with me. I mean, you know, they would give me, like, say, a goal to, to reach. I would hit that goal and say, oh, can you take a little further? Okay, I'll hit that goal. Oh, can you get here? I'll hit that goal. And can you get here? I'm like, what do we have to do to get this funding? I mean, here I am, obviously an expert in this space. So it's not like I'm learning what I'm doing, right? But before Google and Microsoft came along, it, it, it was hard. I'm not going to sit up here and, and be dishonest, regardless of my pedigree and my background, um, the, the color of your skin in this country, right? Because I've been all around the world. This country is um, so impacted by color. I mean, I've been to countries, they seem like other countries outside. I've been to Russia and I've been to Ukraine. They care about color. Out, outside of there in probably China, People don't really care. I mean, I feel like a free man when I go to some other countries, mm -hmm. but uh, for some reason uh, in the United States, they make a really big deal about the color of your skin and mm -hmm. the likelihood of you being able to, you know, build a company that's, that has a, you know, potential market cap of a billion dollars. So uh, some people still question um, our, our company, and then others just jump on board. But that's going to always be there mm -hmm. in the United States. Um, Unfortunately, and I live here, I, and I've been in other countries, but that's just uh, the United States. If you're to advise anyone who's looking to follow your footsteps, what would you advise them in terms of when they're reaching out to these corporates and how, yeah. to, uh, and how to approach them in applying for these funds? Yeah, real easy. You want to have some revenue, right? So you want to have some proof of concept that your process is working and you have some customers. And then from there, and they're like, okay, great. Then they'll you know, give you some money to, because I want people to understand this too. The money from Microsoft at the beginning, the money from Google at the beginning gives them an opportunity to evaluate your company. So if they like your company, they will come in at a greater level. Microsoft, Google, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say, get some revenue, get the resources, continue to build the relationships with them 
and they'll invest more because we're, we're looking at our, our second round of investment for Microsoft right now, and that's much larger than, than our first round of investment. Welcome. Thank you so much. My final question before I let you go, Derek, is that you said your role on earth is to provide the best opportunities for your family or yourself. And this is through owning businesses, property, et cetera. What are some of the challenges that you might have to work to accomplish this goal? Well, because there's not a number of people who look like me who have done that, right? So in America, we, we're looking at the same individuals as, as Robert Smith, as David Stewart, right? Out, outside of that, then it gets into athletes and entertainers. In the United States, we don't, we don't highlight African-Americans who were just slaying business. We hire African-Americans who are slaying entertainment. And as a result, those are the ones who get profiled on television. You haven't seen David Stewart on CNBC. You barely see Robert Smith on television at all because they don't get an opportunity. I remember when I got Microsoft money, you would think that I would get an opportunity to go on CNBC. Yeah. No. So um, we, we have to do it ourselves and get connected to those people that you don't see get promoted. So for me, it was that same guy named Neilan Youngblood. When I met with him, that private equity guy, and he was the one who shared with me, he said, Derek, your responsibility on earth, as I wrote down, I, I got it from him, is to provide the best opportunity for your family. That's going to happen by you creating resources. He says, in this country, you need $100 million to have juice. If you don't have $100 million in this country, you have no juice. So go out and create a company with a hundred million dollar value and you come back and talk to me. I'm like, whoa, are you serious? I had never thought that big, but I do now. So whenever there's an opportunity for Cormant to partner with someone, we think worldwide, it's not, you know, we're looking at, you know, Florida or New York or California. No, we're looking at the UK. We're looking at Brazil. We're looking at Argentina. We're looking at China and we can do it because we have a software company, right? So we don't have to physically be there. People can download our software and they can, like a nurse in UK, can download our software and be delivering you an IV infusion if necessary next day. Wow. Well, Derek, I'm really honored to have this conversation with you. What you're doing is really phenomenal. I and mean, you're encouraging so many people because you're staying grounded. You're not just talking about this, but you're really staying grounded. I can't wait. Just listen to you and I just feel more inspired and I think any other any other young black kid listening to you actually feel inspired any final words before we, we part ways yeah my, my final word is, is always to to find out what encourages you and stay in that space remove anything in your life that causes you any discouragement you will see your your life just move to a totally different level and lastly my life really changed when I got rid of fear, when I stopped fearing that I didn't care if I failed anymore. In this country, we never show a lot of failure. So when I was thinking about, you know, ending my life, because I didn't, I didn't know that failure was part of the process. Failure is part of the process and it's okay. That's what you learn. You don't learn from success. You learn from your failures. Derek Miles, thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Be encouraged. Thank you. <laughs>